proofs of brave and daring. No, Frederick, I shall live and die a pirate king! In the most fleeting pleasure. Good afternoon, everybody, and Dalit, and thank you for the opportunity of coming to talk to you today and having a chat about Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, I've called the talk The Heritage of Gilbert and Sullivan. That's not being pretentious, because there are many reasons why Gilbert and Sullivan deserve that accolade. Let me start by saying, first of all, that W.S. Gilbert, the writer, and Arthur Sullivan, the composer, were together for a period of 25 years from 1871 to 1896. And in that 25 year period, Gilbert and Sullivan wrote 14 shows. That is still a record in the world to this very day. There has been no writer and composer together have written 14 shows. Rogers and Hammerstein, for example, wrote eight shows. Andrew Lloyd Webber at the moment has written 12, but he often has a different libretti, so it's not a similar partnership. On top of all that, Gilbert and Sullivan in the 21st century is second only to Shakespeare as the most played works in the English language throughout the world. That's an accolade enough too. So they are very much part of our theatrical heritage and very much part of the nuts and bolts of theatre in this country, and rightly so. It was a brilliant partnership. And the brilliance of the partnership is through the simple reason you had a writer in the form of W.S. Gilbert, who was a master of his trade, and you had the composer, Arthur Sullivan, equally a master of music. Their coming together brought two equals and two specialists together. Let's have a look at their background, because it's quite important to realise a little bit about them. W.S. Gilbert, or his full name, William Schwenk Gilbert, was born in 1836. The Gilbert family were immensely wealthy. Gilbert was never a person in life that had to worry about where the next penny was coming from. He didn't really have to work in that respect. He was a wealthy man and a wealthy family. They lived in Southampton Row off Covent Garden, and they had a country estate in Hampshire. Gilbert had studied law, and in the late 1850s, he became a barrister and set up chambers in Lincoln's Inn. However, it wasn't long before Gilbert realised that the law in Victorian England was an absolute ass. He realized it was corrupt. He realized it didn't matter what your crime was. If you put enough money in a brown paper envelope, you were gonna get off anyway. He felt appalled at the state of law. And that is an important development for Gilbert. It made him start thinking about Victorian society. And in thinking about Victorian society, he became very interested in the haves and have nots of Victorian Britain. He quickly realized, for example, that only 5% of the population benefited from the Victorian Industrial Revolution. 95% of the people didn't. They lived in the most horrendous living conditions and worked in the most horrible working conditions. Gilbert felt for these people. He felt very much about the inequality of society and began writing about it. He had almost then decided to give up the law, and he started writing in a prolific way. He wrote a book called Bad Ballads, and in Bad Ballads, he set out a lot of characters he'd met in the law, a lot of ne'er-do-wells, a lot of various people to whom he could refer in his later works and build upon this characterization. He was a prolific writer of books, of articles, some small plays, various attractions. He became a member of the Garrett Club in London, and that is an interesting point. At the Garrett Club, Gilbert became friends with Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens was 30 years Gilbert senior, but that didn't matter because they talked a lot about society. 
And if you look at Gilbert's work and his writings, you can quickly see the Dickens influence. The, the, both gentlemen would look at social conditions. They would talk about society issues. They would talk about a whole manner of things. However, the beauty of Gilbert's writing is that he often wrote with a twinkle in his eye. He could make people laugh at themselves. He could point out the idiosyncrasies of Victorian society and make Victorians look at themselves and hopefully laugh at them. For example, Gilbert wrote a piece called Etiquette. It was about two Englishmen who were shipwrecked on a desert island in the South Pacific. They lived on a desert island for five years, but they didn't speak to each other because they hadn't been introduced. Very much Gilbert ridiculing the state of Victorian society. An absolute brilliant, brilliant writer. He was not a musician. Gilbert once said, I only know two pieces of music. One is God Save the Queen and the other isn't. So he was never going to be a man that got himself involved in music. As a writer, he was a brilliant, brilliant wordsmith. Arthur Sullivan couldn't have been more different. Sullivan's family were extremely poor. They were an Irish immigrant family that had settled in Lambeth. And Sullivan was born in 1842. His father was a trumpet player in the Surrey Music Hall. Arthur Sullivan, though, was a boy with a musical leaning. By the age of 10, he'd written a couple of anthems. And by the age of 17, he won the scholarship to the Royal Academy of Music. But importantly, at the age of 19, in 1851, Sullivan, sorry, in 1861, Sullivan won the Mendelssohn Scholarship to study in Leipzig, at the Conservatoire in Leipzig. And Sullivan went to Germany for five years. This was a most important development in Sullivan's career. He was on the path of becoming a classical composer. He was studying melody, he was studying orchestration, he was studying the mechanics of music, how it all came together. He became a great exponent in the works of all the great European composers, particularly interested in Mendelssohn and in Schubert. Sullivan found five lost works of Schubert, which he reorchestrated and presented at concerts in Germany in the early 1860s. Very much, as I say, on the path of becoming a classical composer. However, one of the people that Sullivan met in Leipzig was Rossini. And Rossini said, I always felt that we should write music for the theater in the same way as we write music for the grand opera or the symphony, properly orchestrated, properly put together, thoroughly sound musical production. Sullivan was a fun loving man and he thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to write music for the theatre, to gain a wider audience of music. And he got just that opportunity in 1867 when he cooperated with a writer called F.C. Bernand and they produced the show Cox and Box. Cox and Box had its first night at the Adelphi Theatre in London in 1867. By chance, W.S. Gilbert was then a theatre critic for a London newspaper and he went to see Cox and Box. Now, bearing in mind he wasn't a musician, he, however, liked the idea of this play with music, and he became friends with Arthur Sullivan. In 1871, Gilbert was running his own theatre called the Gaiety Theatre in Regent Street, and he had several plays he'd written, and he wanted to put on something new at Christmas time. And he asked Arthur Sullivan if he would put set one of his plays to music, which Sullivan happily agreed to do. And on the 26th of December, 1871, the very first Gilbert and Sullivan production took place. And that show was called Thespis. It's quite likely that many of you may not have heard of Thespis. That's quite understandable because actually it was a complete failure. It only played for 11 performances. Audiences didn't take to it, people didn't seem to understand it, and actually it was a hocus-pocus nonsense. Good. Um, yeah, so it came off after 11 days, and 
Sullivan was so upset, he, he just refused to talk to Gilbert anymore about it. And, and a lot of the uh, music Sullivan dispensed with, he just didn't understand it. And Gilbert went back to writing normal drama. Their partnership didn't look to be terribly healthy at all. Sullivan needed money at that time. And in the period 1872 to 1874, in those two years, Sullivan became a prolific writer of church music. He wrote 71 hymns in that period. A lot of the hymns that we know today, like Onward Christian Soldiers, or that Titanic hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, or the Christmas hymn, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. All these things Sullivan did prolifically in that period. He needed the money, as he said. Gilbert was writing his plays and being a reasonably successful drama writer. However, that wasn't the end of the partnership, fortunately, because in 1875, another theatre manager, Richard Doyle Cart, was running a series of Offenbach shows, and he wanted something more for his theatre. He remembered Thespis, he was probably the only person in Victorian Britain that did remember Thespis, but he brought Gilbert and Sullivan together again to write a piece for his theatre. And in 1875, Gilbert and Sullivan produced Trial by Jury. Trial by Jury was an immediate success for several reasons. Sullivan's music had matured into the way we know it to be, and Gilbert had learned his lesson and was writing about something he knew about. He was writing about the law, and he was lampooning the law, showing how the law was a complete fool. In trial by jury, for example, the judge says, all thieves who could my fees afford relied on my orations, and many a burglar I restore to his friends and his relations. Putting it out how it was, the audiences loved it. They loved the fact that here was a writer that was brave enough to point out issues that were wrong with Victorian society. Richard Doyle Cart realized that he had a success on his hands with this pair if he could keep them together. And he asked them to write another piece, which they willingly agreed to do. And in 1877, The Sorcerer was produced. The Sorcerer is the first one of the series of shows where Gilbert begins to talk about the issues of society, the inequality of society. In The Sorcerer, for example, the village maiden cannot marry the lord of the manor because of the difference in class and the unacceptability of such a relationship. It was quite a political uh, issue to talk about, but it was also one which resonated with audiences. But it was 1878, with HMS Pinafore, that really set the partnership afire. When HMS Pinafore opened, it played for 700 performances. There had been no show in the history of English theatre that had ever played for 700 performances. Within a few weeks of opening in London, there were six companies touring the show throughout the UK. And within a three months, it had opened in New York, and then in Melbourne, Toronto, Auckland, and so on. And within a year, there were 26 companies alone in North America producing HMS Pinafore. HMS Pinafore was a resounding success. It is also important because it is the first show in which Gilbert starts to talk about political issues and begins to discuss things that were wrong with the government and with politicians in general, as well as carrying on with his theme of social inequality. It's all in the show. For example, what had happened was Benjamin Disraeli, the prime minister at the time, had made Mr. W. H. Smith, who we know as a high street stationer, he'd made W. H. Smith First Lord of the Admiralty. Jobs for the boys. Mr. Smith had never been to sea in his life, never probably never seen a ship in his life, yet he's put in charge of the Navy. So in HMS Pinafore, Gilbert says, stick close to your desk and never go to sea, and you all can be rulers of the Queen's Navy. Disraeli went even further. He made W. H. Smith a Member of Parliament, 
So Gilbert said, I always voted at my party's call and I never thought of thinking for myself at all. I thought so little they rewarded me by making me the ruler of the Queen's Navy. It was strong political message, make no mistake about that. It was really attacking the government of the day, but it was done with music and it was done in a way that almost made it acceptable. Gilbert goes further in Pinafore about social inequality. And in the show, the captain's daughter falls in love with a sailor. And the captain says to his daughter, but my dear, he's a lowly sailor. You are a captain's daughter. And she said, but father, you said everybody is equal. So the captain says, well, so they are. But some of us are more equal than others. That has been a comment which has been used quite a lot in various other ways, but it was Gilbert that originated that. Some of us are more equal than others. Very brilliantly done. I want to stress about the quality of Gilbert's writing because he had a perfect way of giving us a picture of society without ever waffling. He gave it to us straight. If I could just read this piece now, it's about the captain's daughter thinking how her life is living with her father and how it would be if she lived with this lowly sailor. She says, on the one hand, I live in Papa's luxurious home, hung with ancestral armor and old brasses, carved oak and tapestry from distant Rome, rich oriental rugs, luxurious sofa pillows, and everything that isn't old, is from Gillows. But on the other hand, I would live in a dark and dingy room in some back street with stuffy children crying, where organs yell and clacking housewives fume and clothes are hanging out all day are drying, with one cracked looking glass to see my face in and horror dinner served up in a pudding basin. Twelve lines, but we have a perfect picture of Victorian society. And of course, that is such an influence of Dickens coming in through there too. We're left in no mistake about what Gilbert wants to talk about. Pinafore was followed by Prior Penzance in 1879. And I believe now if Neil's system is working, we can have an excerpt from Pirates of Penzance to give a flavor of the music and the words. If it doesn't work, it was on the link I've sent through to you, which you can all enjoy at your leisure. But let, I think it's good now to talk about what is GNS, the actual genre of GNS, because it's not immediately clear to many people just what they are. I mean, they are not opera in the sense of the word. And in fact, neither Gilbert or Sullivan ever referred to their works as opera. They called them pieces, which is very much a Victorian expression which doesn't sit in our ears so clearly. But if they're not opera, they're not operetta either. European operetta, as beautiful as it is, it's generally fair to say that the words do not have a lot of meaning. The music is beautiful, the words are fine, but they're not actually talking about very much, and it doesn't come over terribly clearly. Uh, for example, Franz Lehar, The Merry Widow, I can't even remember who the librettist was. The words somehow are not important, but you can't say that with GNS because the words are as important as the music. But actually, more and more as we think about it, and several people other than us are here are coming to the same view, GNS actually are the origins of today's musical theatre. They were the Les Miserables of the Victorian era, if you like. And it was more than that. GNS was the popular music of the time. People would go and, and get uh, everything they uh, want from uh, the, the sheet music when the new shows came out. They would play it at home. It would be played on barrel organs on street corners. There would be concerts in the park of GNS music. It was popular music throughout the country. And taking it a stage further, when you start looking at the background of American musical theatre, you begin to see comments like Leonard Bernstein said he would never have written West Side Story had he not been influenced by Gilbert and Sullivan. 
Rogers and Hammerstein said the same. Cole Porter said the same. Um, uh, and, and it goes on and on. Stephen Sondheim. Uh, it is always a fact that these people are referring to the influence of Gilbert and Sullivan upon musical theatre. So I think it's fair to say that musical theatre as we know it today didn't begin in New York in the 1920s. It began in London in the 1870s with the works of GNS. And that's where it sits, musical theatre. But it's a brilliant, brilliant partnership. Gilbert and Sullivan always worked in exactly the same way throughout their 25-year career. W.S. Gilbert would write everything. He would write the book, he would write the drama, he would almost produce the play, and he would produce it and do everything uh, uh, so that the show was ready to be performed. And only when it was ready did he take it to Sullivan to set to music. Sullivan never interfered with the words, and equally Gilbert never interfered with the music. It was the brilliance of their partnership together that they had that trust in each other, and it was throughout their career that they worked in that way. The words came first, the music came second. As we shall see, and as it's generally established, there is a lot of social and political comment throughout the whole of their career. Gilbert was obviously a radical, but he was also a thinker. And he thought seriously about things that were wrong with society and wanted to talk about it. Sullivan must have had similar feelings, although perhaps with tongue in cheek, because I cannot see that Sullivan would have set the words to music if he didn't agree with what was being said. He probably had a quiet chuckle to himself at times too, but make no mistake, they were getting pretty well near the mark in many of the times, but they got away with it. And I think the reason that they got away with it is because Sullivan's music is always there to soften the blow. It takes away the edge of the message. There was never an occasion in their 25 years that they were fell foul of the Lord Chamberlain or were sued or anybody came against them with writs. But they were really, really strongly saying issues about society all of the time. Ireland, written in 1882, is a very strong political piece. Make no mistake about that. The message is anti-government and anti-politicians. Gilbert says the House of Commons is a place full of dull MPs in close proximity. When in that house MPs divide, if they have a brain and cerebellum to, they've got to leave that brain outside and vote just as their leaders tell them to. He said about the House of Lords, the House of Lords do nothing in particular, but I suppose do it rather well. I mean, it was very strong pieces. And at the start of Ireland, in the first act, you have a scene where the House of Lords are visiting the countryside and they are putting people in their place. They are saying, bow, bow, ye lower middle classes. We are peers of highest station, paragons of the British nation. Get out of our way. But Sullivan's music there gives a great crescendo to the message. It adds strength to the message and makes it a very powerful delivery of the whole piece, but so brilliantly and cleverly done, and so against government of the day. Gilbert is saying that politicians are useless, get rid of the lot of them, replace them with fairies. We didn't know what 21st century fairies are, but Victorian fairies were just as good. And he's saying, when the fairy queen takes over parliament, she says, every bill and every measure that will gratify my pleasure will be passed by both your houses. We shall sit, if I see reason, through the grouse and salmon season. You're not going to have these long holidays. You're going to have to start working, chum. I mean, it was really good stuff. And people loved it. People were coming to the theatre in droves, excited to see what the next topic was going to be that Gilbert and Sullivan were going to be criticising and highlighting. It was a most brilliant, brilliant, clever way of doing things. 
It wasn't always politics, though. In Princess Ida, written in 1883, Gilbert is talking about the role of women in society. He is saying there should be education for women. There should be universities for women. This was quite a strong message to Victorian ears. And once the university is set up in Princess Ida, Princess Ida and her girlfriends are together and they're talking about what they must be doing. And they say, we must start preparing for votes for women. That's 1883, 30 years before Mrs. Pankhurst, that Gilbert and Sullivan are talking about the need of votes for women. Very cleverly done and very beautifully put in the show. Again, they get away with it because Sullivan's music is always there to soften the blow and makes it acceptable. It was a clever partnership in that respect. The, the great respect they had for each other. I say that Sullivan was always happy to put every word to music and Gilbert was happy for the music to come along. The Mikado, written in 1885, is the most popular of all the Gilbert and Sullivan shows. And in fact, in 2019, it was said that the Mikado is the most played piece of musical theatre anywhere in the world. And that is quite an achievement 140 years after it was first written. But again, it's a clever show. Gilbert had been to see a Japanese exhibition in Knightsbridge, and it gave him the idea to set his next piece in Japan. And he did it as a camouflage, because it's not a Japanese story. It's nothing whatever to do about Japan. It's about the wretchedness of the British political system. And it is highlighted. The bad politicians of the day are named and shamed. Coco's little list in the Ricardo lists a number of ne'er-do-wells both in the political and business life and general life of Victorian Britain that would never be missed. It is highlighted as that uh, how useless they all, all are. Many of you might be aware of or will have seen, I expect, the English national production, the Mikado, which has been at the London Coliseum now for 27 years, so popular it has been. And there you will see that the Mikado is set in a 1920s English spa hotel because it was never a story about Japan. It was a story about highlighting the wretchedness of the political system of the day. And it was so cleverly, cleverly done. And they got away with it again. Solomon's music. Solomon's music always there to soften the blow. Sullivan actually was having a double musical life. In 1882, Arthur Sullivan was knighted by Queen Victoria for his services to music. W.S. Gilbert was not knighted because obviously at the time he'd upset most of the establishment and he was absolutely not ever going to be a gentleman that was going to be knighted. But Sullivan was. And at that time, Sullivan was also writing a number of other works. And it's now being generally recognized that Arthur Sullivan um, was a very great uh, composer in so many ways. His Irish symphony, written about his homeland of Ireland as a homage to Ireland, is reckoned to be a most beautiful work. It plays for about 45 minutes and it indeed is a most marvelous piece. He wrote an oratorio called The Golden Legend. And very recently, people are saying that The Golden Legend is second only to the Messiah as the greatest oratorio ever written. There are numerous other pieces that Sullivan was also writing, but he was also at the same time prolifically carrying on with his works with Gilbert. Sullivan put his all into the work he did with Gilbert, and it completely disposes of the idea that often is put around that Sullivan felt debased by his work with Gilbert. That is not true at all, because he was actually putting every effort into the music that he did with these shows, as any musician will say, uh, at the quality of the music and the style of the pieces going on. It's often talked about the relationship with Gilbert and Sullivan um, as individuals. Uh, and even there's a misapprehension that the two absolutely hated each other. No, that's not true. 
I've looked at the diaries, I've studied this matter many, many times, and they didn't hate each other. They were two completely different characters. And in their 25 years of partnership, there were some disagreements. Well, not some, one about money. Because no matter how much they were worth, and they were by the mid 1880s extremely wealthy, Gilbert would not spend a penny if he didn't have to. He just refused to spend money. And for example, when the Mikado was being produced in 1885, Arthur Sullivan's thought it would be a wonderful idea to import real silk from Japan. Oh yes, and we'll get Liberty of Regent Street to make the dresses up. They'd be beautiful. And of course they were beautiful, but the bill came to 18 and a half thousand pounds, which in 1885 was a lot of money. And, and Gilbert was absolutely appalled. He always thought the next show would be the last, that they would lose everything. The thing would be a failure and there would be a most terrible falling out and, uh, and they'd have an upset. And Gilbert, would, despite his bombardity, he was a funny character like that. He didn't speak to anybody for weeks on end. He went into a real big sulk and that was how it was. But then he would think of the next play. He'd start writing the next play and he'd be as friends as anything with Arthur Sullivan and they'd be together putting it back, you know, the show on the road again and all would be well until another fallout over money. But basically, they had a wonderful respect for each other. That is shown very much, actually, in the gondoliers. When the gondoliers were written in 1889, it was obviously going to be another successful show. And Sullivan wrote to Gilbert and said, I hope the gondoliers will be a shining light into the next century. And if it is, it's because I owe you everything for what you've done in our partnership. Your brilliant direction, your brilliant words. Thank you. And Gilbert wrote to Sullivan and said, it is I who should be thanking you for your brilliant music. You have made our partnership what it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the great thing. The wonderful respect they had for each other. And it shows through that. Previously to the gondoliers, in 1888, um, Gilbert had written Yeoman of the Guard. The Yeoman of the Guard came about because Gilbert had seen an advertisement for the Tower Furnishing Company. And it gave him the idea to write a piece about the Tower of London. And he said, I will set it in a Tudor setting because I know that Arthur Sullivan loves everything to do with Tudor England and it will give Arthur a great deal of pleasure setting this show to music. Would it be possible, Neil, to have a trial of Yeoman of the Guard? Do you want to try if it would work? We'll have a go at it. I'll put it on for a few moments and then uh, see how it goes. Yeah, and if it doesn't, then obviously your people can have a look at it afterwards. OK. Thank you. Shouts and cheer on cheer, hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. We have to find, we have to tear. Come and be something that you can't find, you can't find. 
I'm not sure how that came across, hopefully. But it came across all right, actually. It was better than the last one. So anyway, that was good. It didn't go all the way through, but that's fine. So anyway, the Omen of the Guard is the only one of the 14 which has no political or social satire. It is purely a human storyline. And when Sullivan was setting it to music, he said, I think some of the words or all of the words that Gilbert has written for this piece are some of the most beautiful pieces of uh, drama that I've ever read. And I think they are really magnificent. And there's one piece which was called Is Life a Boon? And Sullivan said, I found these, those words so moving that if ever I was granted a memorial, I would always wish these words to be on my memorial. The words are so beautiful. And so indeed, the Arthur Sullivan Memorial, which is in Embankment Gardens outside the Savoy Hotel, has the words of this song, Is Life a Boon? It was a completely, completely different storyline. And in the second act, one of the characters dies. Richard Doyle Card always was concerned about that. He thought it was not being acceptable for audiences that a character died in a Gilbert and Sullivan piece. But Gilbert stuck to his words and he said it was part of this drama and that's how it to be. So the omen of the guard has always been just something quite different from the rest for so many reasons. Um, as I say, it's a pure drama, it's a pure, uh, it, it's a show which is actually not out of place as a grand opera. It is so, so strong, but it, it's a brilliant piece. Many of you might have seen it over the past few years when it's been done in the Tower of London directly. And there was a wonderful performance of 20, 30 years ago where Tommy Steele played Jack Point. Um, and he was brilliant at it too. And it was a beautiful, beautiful, well done piece. And it was just something different and something quite different in the whole of the Gilbert and Sullivan uh, partnership. About the time of the gondoliers, Arthur Sullivan was also writing a grand opera. And he did it because Queen Victoria said to him, Sir Arthur, you should write a grand opera. You'd be so good at it. And he, being a dutiful servant, did just that. And the piece was called Ivanhoe. It ran for 161 performances. Largely, it has never been heard of or seen since. And Arthur Sullivan was never happy with it. Somebody said to him, Sir Arthur, you should be congratulated on your grand opera. And he said, well, it's more than I think it's worth. A cobbler should stick to his last. And he went back to Gilbert and got on with the gondoliers, which again proves the fact that Gilbert, that Sullivan was putting his all into the music he did with Gilbert. So that dispels that belief as well. In 1893, we had the Utopia Limited. Utopia Limited is um, a show which we do not see very much of, although I'm pleased to say that if you manage to come and see the 2022 Gilbert and Sullivan Festival, Utopia is going to be one of the featured performances. Utopia isn't done for the simple reason it's a big show to put on. There are 16 principles. It's an expensive show to put on, and that is the only reason why it tends not to be done very often. But as a GNS piece, it is absolutely brilliant. It's back again to a South Sea Island setting. And in this setting, the king is saying to courtiers, what is wrong with our country? And they say, well, we don't have the British political system. We should have two political parties. Let's have two British political parties and all will be well. So that's what they do. They have two political parties, one undoing what the other one has done before it and making a general mess of things. And after a year, the king said, get rid of the politicians. We'd be better off being cannibals. Gilbert was still at it. But also in Utopia, and equally and importantly, 
Gilbert is talking about the problems of the Victorian business practices. He's talking about how companies were set up with little capital so that they could go bust and not have to pay anybody their creditors. They could go bust on a Monday and start up under a new name on Tuesday, leaving creditors in their wake. Gilbert highlighted this. He highlighted too about the need, the uh, problem of banks. Never give money to a banker. Give them your money on a Friday, they've lost it for you by Monday. So many of the issues which are pertinent through to the present day were highlighted. 1896, The Grand Duke was the last of the series of shows uh, for the very sad reason that by then Sullivan was suffering a period of ill health. And Arthur Sullivan died in 1900. On Queen Victoria's instruction, Sullivan was buried in St Paul's Cathedral with full honours. Um, she regarded him, and I think it's been proved now, rightly so, as the greatest of all British composers. And that is that. Gilbert's life, obviously, in the theatre was over. And in he became, his life went full circle, and he went back to the law. He became a magistrate. He was living then in Middlesex at the house we now know as Grimsdyke near Harold Weald, which is a hotel now, and which has been preserved as Gilbert's family home. Um, and he became a magistrate in Middlesex. And finally, in 1907, Edward VII knighted W.S. Gilbert, and the citation on the knighthood said, for your services as a magistrate, with no mentioning of his 25 years in the theatre, which upset him. He tended to, to be called W.S. Gilbert and wasn't Sir William, uh, only on very special occasions. And Gilbert died in 1911 and was buried just in a family grave at Churchyard in Stanmore in North London without any other special recognition. But that's not the legacy of this pair. The legacy of Gilbert and Sullivan is that the shows are up and running and alive and well in the 21st century and throughout the world. It's not just a case that GNS is popular in English speaking countries. They are indeed very popular in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and, and places like that. Australian National Opera have a fantastic season every year in the Sydney Opera House of GNS. Always brilliant performances. And there are hundreds of different professional companies throughout uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Britain, carrying on with GNS. But what is interesting is that GNS has become more and more popular in non English speaking countries. And places like Latvia, Lithuania, Sweden, Hungary, Spain, Portugal, uh, Belgium, Holland, Germany. There are two companies in Germany producing GNS. And in 2018, for the very first time, a production of the Mikado was given in Moscow. And it was received with such great acclaim, there is now a company in Russia performing GNS throughout the country all the time. And when you ask countries, the non-English speaking countries, what is the popularity of GNS? Why are the shows doing so well? They say for two reasons. Obviously, the wonderful quality of Solomon's music. It is absolutely sublime, but equally, the words have meaning. We can always read something of importance within the words, and there's always something to say, and that is found to be a very special point of the shows. The words, and the issues that Gilbert were talking about in Victorian times have as much pertinence through to the 21st century as they do when they were first written. And that has kept the shows alive. We can see exactly the same problems in society now as there were then. And that is something that was appreciated by society at the time. People were going to the theatre to hear what the latest topic that Gilbert and Sullivan were focusing on. They enjoyed it. Now, as with all forms of culture, not everybody likes everything. There is no culture which is university likes. And obviously there are many people that don't like GNS, but if they think about it and give it a reason, you can see 
the quality of the works, the beautiful Solomon music. You will go and see a GNS show and you will remember the music, you will remember the songs, you will find it a spectacular evening. And equally, you then start to think about the words and you can judge from the words the quality of what is being said. And that is a very, very clever idea that these two did it so well and brought it so much together. Whatever you may say about GNS, there is one thing that GNS must always be regarded in a most positive way. They caused a revolution in British theatre. Before GNS, people from all walks of life never went to the theatre together. The upper classes went to the drama or the opera, and the lower classes went to the musical. But it was only with the coming of GNS was it the first time in the history of British theatre that people from all walks of life went to the theatre at the same time to see the same show. And in fact, Gilbert and Sullivan insisted that 100 tickets for each show were sold at the lowest possible price to allow everybody in. But when you have a look at the social history of theatre, that then brings about another interesting comment. Because the lower classes sitting in the balcony would laugh cock a hoop at what Gilbert was saying about the people sitting in the stalls. Yet those in the stalls would say, oh, Sir Arthur's music is very beautiful. We don't always hear all the words, which of course is a point. It was the fact that Solomon's music did take the edge away. But make no mistake, the strength of the message and the strength of the words is very, very strong indeed. In the 21st century, it's interesting to take a quick look at how the shows are produced, because after all, they were Victorian shows and the Victorian theatre had small stages. There wasn't a lot of action. There wasn't a lot of movement possible. But now it's totally different. So all the GNS performances now are completely reproduced, what they would have been even a few years back. And there is much more movement. There is much more choreography. Everything is happening on stage. There is tremendous activity and tremendous strength of performance going on all of the time. Look at some of the modern videos, the videos you will be enjoying. I hope you'll, you'll see it from the National Gilbert and Sullivan Opera Company at the festival. It, Australian National Opera with their productions, which you can see on DVD. The shows are so vibrant, they're so brilliant. And there's activity and there's action and there's dancing going on all of the time and a swift movement, but everything has something in common. The shows are to the original Gilbert words and the original Sullivan's music. They are not altered. If it isn't broken, don't mend it kind of style. The music and the words remain the same, apart from one song, Coco's Little List in the Mikado. When it was first written, Gilbert said, this must be a song which is updated. At the time, it was talking about ne'er-do-wells and politicians and general misfits of society relevant to 1885. Gilbert lived for 26 years and he was forever updating Coco's little list. And so when you see the show now, you will find the list includes issues relevant to the present day, not to Victorian times. And Gilbert always instructed after his death, that that song must always be updated. And that's why, for example, English national production of the Mikado at the moment, when it comes back this autumn, will be having issues relevant to 2021, and not to Victorian period. But that's tongue in cheek and done as it is expected. Many of us will remember from childhood that GNS was very popular in schools. Um, it's not so much now. These things move on, obviously, it might come back. But where it is tremendously popular is in university groups. Every year at the festival, they have a matinee season of university shows. And in 2019, there were 18 different university groups producing their GNS productions. Brilliantly done, all in the most wonderful production concept, very fresh looking at the pieces true to Sullivan's music, true to Gilbert's words, but a different way of presenting the show. And the reason universities find the show so good is because 
of the quality of music and again because the words have so much meaning they are a point of study and a point of looking at a period in society and reflecting on the words and the issue so it, it actually fills all these points but gns are, are not victorian museum pieces they are vibrant pieces of musical theater and if for example you have a look at the second act of the gondoliers there is a piece in that called the dance of the kachuka and it plays a four and a half minutes when it's in in its entirety and in that four and a half minutes the whole stage is alive with dance and activity and music it's a beautiful piece and i think if you were to show it to somebody that didn't know what it was they would think it was from a piece of 21st century musical theater and would not have realized it came from 1889. That is the brilliance of Gilbert and Sullivan's work and how they have maintained their interest and maintained their audiences through to the present day. And somebody once said to me, oh, GNS is a Victorian museum piece that should be stuck in a cupboard and forgotten about. No, that of course is not so. And if there's one word, one line that Gilbert wrote, which is just as relevant to 2021 as it was in 1881. It's this, he said, Sundays come round at regular intervals, but it always take the railway by surprise. I mean, that is brilliant, Gilbert's brilliance, one-liners, and he's just threw it at you. Fine. So I hope you enjoy some GNS. I hope you manage to see some good shows as uh, theatres are coming back into being again. Enjoy the videos, and if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to talk about it and ask anything you may have now. Thank you for the opportunity of talking today, and over to you for some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. I think we'll all give a silent clap to him. We're all muted, and all. thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. And I'm sure you've all got lots of questions for Bernard. The best way of, for questions is either wave frantically at me, we've only got two screens to watch out for, or you can put it in chat if you want, So, and then you'll be asked to unmute yourself. So if anybody's got a question, please uh, raise a hand or wave at me. Janet, are you asking or are you just scratching your ear? <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching this on transcript for some, for some reason. Um, I just want, I have seen, I remember, I've had always been brought up with Gilbert and Sullivan, and I absolutely adored them. Um, but what I wondered is there have been various attempts to bring it up to date. Uh, this is going back some time. The uh, ratepayers are lengthy, I remember. Yes, indeed. Um, played for 11 performances. <laughs> what? They played for 11 performances. Oh, <laughs> you didn't like it? No. Oh. Um, okay, <laughs> I just wondered what, um... Well, you see, um, I, I, some of the words were a bit very strange. There's been a hot Mikado, there's been a black Mikado. All of them have gone the same way. They, they tend not to last, whereas the originals, um, they, 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 they take over and they, they work. Uh, I don't know, the Rape Pairs Island, the idea was quite a good one, actually, but it was just very badly produced, I think. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Anybody else waving at me? Yes, Pamela, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Hello. I just wonder whether the uh, whether the Gordon Sullivan are on YouTube. Where would be the best place to come and watch them online? Well, the the International Gilbert Sullivan Festival have a very good GNS Opera TV website. If you go onto that one, all the performances are available to see there. Did you hear that? Yes, thank you. Yeah, fine. Yeah, that, that, that has every single of the 14, all 14 shows are available to see on that. www.gsopera.tv. It's on that video um, that, that Neil has to send round to you. It gives a link to that if you want it. 
And I did find that if you just put in the name of the opera into YouTube search, it will come up with every every conceivable country playing mm. them. So there's dozens yeah. to look for. Any more questions? Anyone waving? Yeah, Bernie, I'll, if you unmute yourself, please, Bernie. Um, there does seem to be very, very few professional productions of Gilbert and Sullivan, other than English National Opera. Nobody seems to do it. Well, actually, that's not so, sir. Um, there are a lot of companies. Scottish Opera are doing it this year. Opera North are doing it. The National Gilbert and Sullivan Opera Company are doing it. There are, there are about four product, four companies in Britain that are doing it, yeah. But I presume these are mostly in the provinces. They never come to London. Well, English National have the well, monopoly in Colosseum, and the other companies tend not to want to get there. But they, they do. Um, yeah, I mean, Scottish Opera, they are going to be at Hackney Empire, for example. Oh. Um, watch out for that. Sorry? I have to watch out for that. Yeah, they, they were supposed to come this year, but obviously they didn't, and they put it back to next year. Uh, and they're having a season at Hackney Empire. Um, I think Opera North often come to, or do do, and Welsh National are doing it, and they're going to, uh, they are going to be doing um, Covent Garden at the Royal Opera House in about a year's time. And that will be a first occasion or second occasion. And they're going to do Yeoman of the Guard at the Royal Opera House. And that's the only time at Covent Garden have had a GNS show. Yeah, they are around, but of course, the last 18 months, everybody's been kind of dormant, you see. <laughs> Angela, you've got a question? Unmute. I was just wondering, because they were so political at the time, do you think there was any motivation for, uh, with them to actually stir up any kind of groups that would um, campaign against the chronic injustice of the time? Oh, or yeah. do you think they were kind of saying it as it was in order to provide a bit of a feel-good factor? I think they were saying it as an influential factor. I think they were saying it to make people aware. I, I don't believe they ever thought they could change society. But I think they wanted to make people aware and not just let things be brushed under the curtain. The only show that seemed to have any effect whatsoever was the Pirates of Penzance, because in Pirates of Penzance, Gilbert was talking about the ineffectiveness of the British police force. And he pointed out in Pirates of Penzance that the police were useless, that they would do whatever they could not to get involved. And that was in 1879. And there was a big shake-up of the police force in the 1880s. And many people think that the Pirates of Penzance could have had an effect on, upon that. But generally, no. I mean, all the issues Gilbert were talking about, I mean, they're just the same today as they were then. So they didn't have any changes. But I think they just made people question and think about issues. Re so it reinforced what people knew already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's called a private eye kind of mantra, really, yeah. isn't it? You know. Anybody else want to? Oh, yes, I can see Stephen, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Stephen, yes, you are unmuted. Off you go. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the film Topsy Turvy. Um, do, do, do you think it, it had a grain of truth to it? Oh, very much so, because Mike Lee, the producer of Topsy Turvy, is a very great GNS enthusiast. Oh. And he did it with quality, and he did it with uh, real background to the subject. And as you know, he has produced Pirates of Penzance for English National Opera as well. So, um, you know, yeah, yeah, it did have a lot of truth in it, and it showed the, the sort of odd character that actually Gilbert was as a person. He was awfully pernickety. <laughs> Yes, Robert. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that uh, that Gilbert's satire was in the spirit of punch, and they were content. Yeah. They were content, yeah. of course. Yeah. 
course, you know, and you can see, you can see the the, car, the 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 characters in the cartoons in Punch being on the stage in the Gilbert and Sullivan Opera. You but, can. Hmm. I just want to say one thing. I've got my copy of Macmillan's complete uh, libretto here. And yeah. I mean, I find the ending of The Omen of the Guard absolutely, you know, I just can't cope with it. And I do, I have read somewhere that and, and that he was in, they asked him to change, they asked them to change, the, the audience has asked them to change the ending so that Jack Point didn't die at the end. Well, actually, it was Richard Doyle Cart that asked him to change the ending. Right. Because he said he didn't think audiences would accept Jack Point dying. No. But Gilbert refused, and he wanted that to be as it was, the drama of the storyline. Uh, and actually, it's fairly well accepted. I don't think, I don't know quite what happened in all the time, Victorian times, but now it's reasonably accepted, that ending. I don't think anybody violently objects, you know? Okay, then. But at the stage direction does say, and you're the expert, Bernard, you can tell me if this is right or not, it says, uh, Fairfax embraces Elsie as Point falls insensible at their feet. Yeah. So perhaps he doesn't die after all. Perhaps he just comes all over giddy and faints and then comes around a bit later on. I think you'll find now that most, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time he dies. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you anyway. Thank you anyway. Thanks for the comment. Somebody has asked a question on chat, Neil. Um, just a sec. Yes, Jill, would you like to ask your question? Was there any female input? Not really. I'm afraid to say no. Um, not really. Gilbert was married, but his wife was not involved. And Sullivan wasn't married, but he had a lot of girlfriends and lady friends, and they certainly weren't involved. So I don't think there was any particularly female input, no. But you did, you did mention about uh, talking about uh, women getting the vote in education. Was that not Well, yeah, the... that was something that it was part of. Yeah, I mean, that was what Gilbert and Sullivan thought was a topic worth highlighting. But I don't have any reckon. I don't know who other other than themselves, who came up with the idea. I don't think Gilbert's wife was involved in that suggestion. I've never seen it written anyway. Um, I'm sure you would agree that uh, all their references to politicians of the time couldn't possibly be uh, parallel with today's uh, situation, could it? <laughs> <laughs> They wouldn't get away with it today. That's the truth of the matter. Anyone else want to make a comment? Somebody did send a note to you, Bernard, about um, an involvement with a, a lady in, uh, in Sydenham who was involved. <laughs> yes, that's right. You, you, Sullivan had two lady friends there. They were sisters, weren't they? Yeah. They yeah, played one off against the other. He was quite a ladies' man, Sullivan. So, thank you very much indeed, Bernard. I think that was a most enlightening hour, or hour and a quarter of uh, uh, information about Gilbert and Sullivan. Ab absolutely incredible how you managed to cram so much information in. And a very enlightening part as well for people who do, like myself, who don't know so much about their work, but the tunes always go round in one's head. Yes. Without, without listening to the words quite as seriously. Uh, it just amazes me how, uh, when you see some of the, the singers, the speed that they get the words out at, it, it's absolutely incredible how they're able to do that. Yeah. And, uh, you've highlighted some of the, the wonderful parts of Gilbert and Sullivan and all the things that they, they fought for and were thinking. I'd like everybody to, if you can unmute themselves, we can give a, a loud applause. If you don't unmute yourself, we'll give a quiet one. So thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cannot cut off another's head until he's cut his own off. I've got 
got a little list. I've got a little list of society offenders who might well be underground, and they'd none of them be missed. They'd none of them be missed. Three little days from school, I'll be in person, school, go 